Hello everyone and welcome to Inside Healthcare. In this program we will tell you about a new way to treat your lower back pain and neck pain. It might be just what your doctor ordered. But first we begin by taking an in-depth look at a disturbing trend, a growing problem of heroin in Minnesota. We're very pleased to have with us one of the state's leading medical addiction experts, Dr. David Friends, with the Healthiest Mental Health and Addiction Services. Thank you for being with Thanks us. Thanks for having me. So how big of a problem is this in the state and, and why? It's a big problem and a growing problem. It's part of a larger trend that involves abuse of narcotics. And so heroin is sort of an extension of, of a baseline problem that's sort of mushroomed over the past decade. And how does that go from the like painkillers and those into heroin? Yeah, so narcotics or opioids, we'll, we'll sort of use those words interchangeably, uh, comprise prescription pain pills, so the types of things you'd get from a doctor, as well as heroin. And heroin is a plant-derived opioid, very much like the, the painkillers your doctor would give you. And um, people get addicted to those at a high rate? Or? So yeah, people become addicted to, to painkillers, uh, pre prescription pain pills. And often when your medical source dries up, a doctor is no longer willing to write a prescription for it. You have to start looking for other options, illicit options. And pain pills are fairly expensive on the street. People have a, a hard time finding them or paying for them. And heroin right now is very inexpensive by comparison. So people sort of gravitate from pain pills to, to heroin for cost reasons. Yeah, you just didn't hear about heroin <clears throat> in Minnesota or to the extent that you're hearing it as you are today. So what is it about the heroin that's around today that um, um, is becoming so addictive, it's readily available, the cost you said are? Yeah, so heroin's okay. always been available to, to some degree. If you go back in time, it's been a problem off and on in the United States for a century or more. The trend that we're seeing lately with heroin is that it is very pure uh, compared to the past, an order of magnitude more pure, and then the cost is very low. And so people who were otherwise averse to using needles can now swallow it or snort it or smoke it. Previously, the purity was so low, you almost had to inject it to get high off of it. Um, but now it's so pure, you don't necessarily have to inject it. You could use it some other way. And socially, people find that more acceptable. And I, we've talked in the past that you're seeing even younger young people than in the past getting addicted to heroin. For sure. Probably the average age or the average demographic for the people that we're treating for heroin at this point in time is uh, people in their late teens, early 20s. Whereas before, this was sort of a problem among people who were older in their 40s, 30s, and 40s. Oh, really? Yeah, and so there's, there's been a downward shift in the demographic of the people who are using opioids and heroin. And this isn't just unique to Minnesota. This is happening around the country. Absolutely. If you look at recent uh, coverage, Rolling Stone had a recent issue where the Vermont heroin problem was featured prominently in Rolling Stone. That was within the last issue or two. The New Yorker, two issues ago, had a story about Kansas a big problem in the, in the heartland. They also had another story uh, within the last few months. So um, where is this heroin coming from that's so pure? Heroin is, is grown, it's a, it's a plant, and so heroin comes from a plant. It comes from the opium poppy. It's the same plant that makes beautiful flowers if you don't mess with the plant. Traditionally, uh, it's been coming from Asia and Southeast Asia, although there's pretty good evidence that the heroin in Minnesota is originating in Mexico. And it's just coming straight up from there? And yeah, it comes in across the border, across the Mexican-U.S. border, and there's various routes, but eventually it finds its way to Minnesota for distribution. So you're with the Healthiest Mental Health and Addiction Services, which is at St. Joe's Hospital. What are you seeing there personally with um, patients coming in? So we have a 32-bed hospital-based treatment unit. It's at St. Joseph's Hospital in downtown St. Paul. And there's 32 beds, they are always occupied. We have basically 100% occupancy with a two to three week waiting list. And what we've seen over the past few years is that the types of people seeking treatment have been largely those with opioid problems, so prescription pain pills and heroin, whereas maybe 10 years ago it would have been a largely alcohol-based problem. So the majority of our patients a decade ago probably would have been struggling with alcoholism. Now it's the majority are struggling with opioid addiction. And then it's just the young, the young age. Uh, younger people seeking treatment. So what treatments are available? What works? What doesn't work? The treatments that are available, there's a few options. The, the, I'll start with the one that's most effective. It's been studied extensively for decades and that's using medications. 
And so in the 1960s, because there was really no credible treatment for opioid addiction, some investigators in New York at Rockefeller University investigated the use of methadone to treat heroin users. And their early research, which demonstrated effectiveness, led to subsequent studies, and it really is the treatment of choice at this point for opioid addiction. There's a newer medication, new to the United States maybe within the past 10 years, although available in Europe for a, a couple decades by now. It's called buprenorphine. The, the brand names for that medication are Subutex, Suboxone, and Zubsolve. And it's a methadone-like medication that people take as well. And those two medications are the most effective treatments that we have at this point for treating opioid addiction. So is there um, pushback from society from the, um, about treating an addiction with a medication? I mean, aren't you replacing one thing with another thing? Yeah, that's a myth, and it's sort of a Minnesota myth. In Minnesota, we have a long history of what's called abstinence-based treatment where the, the principal solution was to completely abstain from any mood-altering substance. And so in Minnesota, there's really been a lot of antipathy to using medications to treat addiction. All I would say, again, within the last five years, because of the scope of the problem and because other treatments haven't been very effective, that there's, there's growing uh, comfortableness. People are, are becoming much more comfortable using medications to treat addiction. And I've also read, besides the increase of heroin use, that um, there's been a dramatic increase also in the number of overdose deaths from heroin as well. And why is that? Right. So you can look at, like, th there's some curves that you can superimpose upon each other. One is the number of admissions for treatment for opioid use disorders, addiction to pain pillars and heroin. And those have gone up uh, a thousand percent basically in a decade. Wow. So a, a huge increase. Um, and you can look at the ov overdose death rate, and it sort of follows the same trend. When you have more people using heroin, and they're using a pure opioid, something with high purity, the risk of making mistakes and dying exists. You know, it seems like that we've had some celebrity cases that have been made the headlines. For and, sure. And it seems like, too, that I've read where they were in rehab, and then they get out of rehab, and then they... Die and, and, this is the, and this is the danger, actually, of abstinence-based treatment. So when people come to treatment and they're actively using heroin or another opioid and, and they come off of that, their body, which was once used to heroin, loses what's called tolerance. So the body is no longer used to the heroin being there. And if, if you resume heroin use, it's very easy to overdose because your body's not used to it. It's not tolerant to the heroin being there. Even if you've there. had it in the past. Even if you've had it in the past, you lose tolerance in treatment. So if you go to treatment and you're off of heroin or an opioid for a period of time, your body loses that tolerance or immunity, and so it's very easy to make mistakes and die. What do you, how do you advise family and loved ones when they have someone going through a heroin addiction or through treatment? What kinds of advice do you give them? Well, the first thing is to take care of themselves, meaning the family taking care of themselves. Mm -hmm. and so. Uh, set clear boundaries, make sure that you're not enabling the person who is uh, abusing substances like heroin. And so making sure that you're not loaning them money, giving them access to money in, in ways that would allow them to continue to procure drugs. Then in terms of thinking about addiction, we have to change our mindset, especially in Minnesota. Addiction is a chronic illness, much like other chronic illnesses. And family members just want it to go away. They want people to go to treatment, they want them to get treated, and they want the problem to be resolved. And unfortunately, that's just not the way addiction behaves. There's ups and downs with, with addiction. And so sort of thinking about addiction like diabetes and other chronic diseases can, can be very helpful. So once you're on that path, it's a lifelong Yeah, it's a journey. lifelong diagnosis. It doesn't mean that it's a lifelong problem, but problems are not unheard of. They're, not, they're, they're fairly common. And so small slips, small relapses are, are just part of the illness. It's not a catastrophe and you just sort of have to think in those terms. Do you see that this heroin problem changing anytime soon, reversing, becoming less prevalent? And I don't. Uh, now the, the government has taken steps to seize heroin, but as the Star Tribune and other media outlets point mm -hmm. out, um, it just keeps on coming. You arrest one guy and the drug cartel finds another distributor. And so on the supply side, I don't think we're going to cut off supply. And so really the solutions are going to be demand-oriented solutions. So what can we do to decrease demand for opioids? And I'm not convinced that we're doing enough 
prevention at this point to prevent people from becoming addicted to, to opioids and heroin. So you think there should be more education? For sure. I don't think demand-oriented solutions where you try to stop drugs from entering the country are, are, are the solution. You have to do prevention, much like you do prevention for, for cancers of various types, uh, diabetes, et cetera. There have to be the same sustained, heavy, intensive public health efforts on prevention. And as an addiction specialist, you would know that these things just can't happen overnight. It takes time. And they don't. And, and traditionally, we, as healthcare organizations, we've responded to addiction once it's developed. And so you really have to move upstream into primary care environments and work on prevention in those environments, much like you'd work on, again, prevention of colon cancer, prevention of breast cancer, other diseases that you do prevention on. So is there work in that primary care setting to um, identify perhaps someone who might be at risk for um, a, um, developing an addiction to um, painkillers? And Probably the biggest prevention effort is gonna be most likely to be successful in the short term is being more judicious in prescribing of painkillers. A lot of people will tell you, I got into heroin through a painkiller that was prescribed to me, often for a very legitimate reason. And so part of it is being very judicious in, in prescribing painkillers like Vicodin, Percocet, OxyContin, knowing that that can be a gateway to addiction as well as heroin use. So it's a long, multiple process of right. So to reverse Right, so Health the organization I work for, they've come up with guidelines for opioid prescribing in primary care clinics and policies. Th those are good efforts to sort of turn off the spigot uh, in, in a way for opioids that can lead to addiction. What would be some final advice that you would want to leave with our viewers about this issue, about this problem? What can they do? The risk is often in your own home, and so parents often receive opioids from healthcare providers for an abscess tooth, so they'll get Percocet after a root canal, or they'll get uh, Percocet or Vicodin for throwing out their back, and they often don't use it all. They put it in the medicine cabinet at home, and then it's readily available to, to teenagers. And so a lot of times, just ridding your home of risk is a, is a very significant step into preventing your child from being exposed to th these very addictive substances. And I know Washington County and Ramsey County, they've had, um, you can dispose of unused medications right. and things like that. The, the United States Drug Enforcement Administration every year has a drug give back day where you can bring all of your medications to a drop centers and they'll take them off your hands. They collect tons, literally tons, of medications that are unused every year and then they dispose of them. Because you don't want to be just tossing these in the toilet or something. Like you that. could, um, although that creates its own problems. And pharmacies are actually very reluctant to take controlled substances back. Interesting. Yeah. So final advice or comments for our viewers and where they can get more information or how they could contact you? Um, I'm easily found on the web, uh, www.davidfriends.com. And so my website has a lot of heroin-related information on it that I think is, is credible and factual. Uh, for treatment, people can certainly seek it through Health East. They can go to the mainhealtheast.org uh, website and go down to mental health and addiction care, and then there's links to the services we offer, including addiction treatment. Well, Dr. David Friends, always a pleasure to have you with us. Great information as always. Thanks for having me. Thank you.